The captain is dead. When we first started today, the seven of us were thoroughly creeped out, terrified of what might lie in wait for us as we awoke in our cabins. Me especially. After hearing the music, the voices, the screaming, filtering in from down the hall and the very lounge we'd slept in for the last two nights, but I never imagined that when the day would end, there would there be two less of us. Three, technically. As hard as it may be to concentrate on anything but that horrific fact, I'll try and get to what you guys have said and commented. To say I appreciate everything that you've suggested is to say all of us are thankful. And that would be a massive understatement. I feel like you guys are what helped me cling to the last vestige of sanity remaining in my mind. To the people who have commented about making it to either the engine room or the bridge to try and stop or sabotage or even change the course of the ship. It was the very idea the captain came to us with when we gathered. But as I'll explain in a minute, it seems that... I don't know what to call them. Ghosts? Entities? Evil spirits? Hell, demons, for all I know. Anticipated the move on our parts. Salt was one of the few ingredients we didn't seem to find in the veranda grill. Though, for what the map of the ship shows, there are numerous more restaurants on board, so we're going to keep our eyes open for it. I just hope you'll be right and that these things are unable to cross it. To the person who mentioned the Morse code transmitter, I'd forgotten to mention last night that it had been torn out along with the radio microphone. These things very much do not want us trying to call for help. We're most definitely not splitting up anymore, either. Knowing what we do now, it's just too dangerous even if it means slower going. But I should get on and tell what happened. The four of us were woken up by several rapid bangs on our cabin door. After seeing the program which had been shoved under the door last night, I was only able to catch small spurts of sleep, ones that were all interlaced with horrendous nightmares of dozens, hundreds, thousands of the specters outside pressing up against our cabin asking us to open the door and inviting us to the party down the hall, before bursting into laughter and screams. So when the knocking began, I shot up from where I'd been curled up on the room's love seat. My clouded, half-asleep mind filled with panic and terror. They're here. They're here for us. However, the voice on the other side of the door filled us with a momentary sense of calm. It was the captain's voice. But remembering what had happened with the walkie-talkie yesterday, Wyatt shushed us and crept to the door, putting his eye against the peephole. He stood there for a moment, then pulled away a look of relief in his eyes. It's really him. He breathed out before unlocking the door. Instantly, the captain strode in, followed close behind by Vinny. For a moment, the relief returned, until I realized that they were alone. He answered my unasked question before I was able to open my mouth. Will's gone. He put a hand over his face, taking a deep breath before continuing. I don't know how he managed to slip out without waking me, but when Vinny woke up a few minutes ago to be able to use the bathroom, he found our cabin door unlocked, standing open. There's no sign of him anywhere. The man's words hung in the tension and dread-filled air. Every single one of us knew exactly where he'd gone. He'd, he'd gone off to find that woman again. Diana. Finally, the silence was broken by Andrew. So, what do we do? A pained look crossed the captain's face. I... I'm, I'm honestly torn, boys. Part of me thinks we should immediately try finding him, if it's not already too late. But another thinks we should try and find another way to either stop the ship or sabotage the engines. He looked over at me. Night. Will you check the computer to see what those people have said? I shook my head and began to turn to boot up the laptop. When I caught sight of the program lying on the floor, 
I knew if I showed it to them, the already palpable fear infecting our group would grow. But at this point, hiding anything might end up being a fatal mistake. They need to see it. I cleared my throat. Uh, sir, before I do that, there's something that you all need to see. I picked up the program and handed it to the captain. Everyone crowded around as he flipped it open. I saw the men's faces turning pale as they read the notice inside. I saw their names written there. Andrew let out a shaky breath. Okay. I think I'm starting to turn into a believer of the whole ghost ship idea, he said quietly. After that, we quickly broke out the laptop and checked your comments. After reading them for a few moments, Wyatt pointed, smiling slightly. Cap, look. Cap, looks like they have the same idea you do. Either taking control of the ship or straight up sabotaging the engines. The captain stared for another second at the screen before nodding. And that settles it. We head back for the bridge. If that doesn't work, the engine room. He gazed seriously around at all of us. From now on, we don't split up from each other at all. It'll mean things will be done slower, but in my personal opinion, it might just be safer. He shot a glance back at the open door to our cabin. Especially with Will being who knows where on board. Putting away the laptop, I quickly took a moment to set the solar charger on the lip of the porthole to be able to gather a charge. The laptop's battery had gotten precariously low, and the six of us moved out in the hall, closing the door behind us. We now carried three fire axes we'd taken from red emergency boxes scattered around the ship. My head swung on a swivel as we passed each T-junction, half expecting something, now someone, to lunge at us from around a corner. The silence only broken by the low throbbing sound of the ship's engines rising from far below us didn't help to ease the atmosphere that had fallen over us. I didn't know if I was more afraid of running into the ship's inhabitants again or our own colleague. When we reached the doors to the lounge, however, all thoughts evaporated in my head as we froze, staring into the room. It still looked the same as it had yesterday, with two exceptions. The first is that the raised section of the floor near the back of the room where the band would play, one that was desolate and empty when we'd arrived, no longer was. Even from across the room, I saw instruments set up on it, violins, trumpets, bass, a drum set, and more were set up as though they'd been put out by a band. The realization flashed to my mind. The music I heard last night, it, it wasn't a hallucination, it was real. The second noticeable change of the room was the clear after remnants of a party. Confetti and balloons, which had lost the helium needed to keep them afloat, littered the dance floor, and on a few tables we could see half-empty wine and cocktail glasses. They had themselves one hell of a shindig last night, Vinny said softly. I shot a glance at him. The look on his face mirrored the emotions I felt. In any other situation, the scene would have been one to feel happy about, people celebrating something. Here and now, though, it evoked the sort of dread and fear that one would get stepping into a haunted house. The captain shook his head slowly, then gestured to us. Come on, let's keep moving. And moving quickly, we crossed the lounge, kicking balloons out of our way before heading to the bridge. The hell? Spencer exclaimed as we stood in front of a hatch which led to the bridge area of the ship, which yesterday had stood wide open, held in place by the metal hook which had been set into an eye swivel on the wall. But now, as we stared in disbelief, it had been tightly shut. Not just shut, locked. Try as hard as we might, to the point our hands turned red and stung from exertion, the handle refused to spin. You've got to be fucking kidding me, Andrew muttered as the captain began patting at his pockets. His head snapped up, his eyes wide as he realized something. The keys are gone, he said, before shaking his head. Will must have lifted him from me before he snuck out. The realization that we'd been effectively blocked from reaching the helm caused the hopeless feeling we'd had yesterday, seeing the ship moving, to return. I let out a sigh and put my back to the hatch, resting my head on the cool metal. 
For a moment, we slowly made our way down to the bowels of the ship. I already knew full well what we'd find, but still followed the increasingly hunched shoulders of the captain down the narrow graded steps, flicking on our flashlights as the incandescent bulbs over our heads became fewer and far between. When we reached the hold and rounded the final corner, I saw what I expected. The metal hatch, above which the words engine and boiler rooms were stamped, was closed. Wyatt suddenly burst into a sprint, pushing past the captain to the door where he frantically, almost hysterically, began yanking on the handle. It was as if he was hoping he'd be able to wrench it open by sheer will, but it remained steadfast. Finally, he stopped and began kicking the door. Fuck you, you stupid piece of shit, ship! He screamed, his face bouncing off the graded floor and pipes, echoing away into the gloom. And fuck all you long-dead ancient last century as ghosts! He collapsed to the floor, beginning to cry softly. He couldn't do anything but watch. Stunned by the man's apparent mental break, Andrew and the captain, Spencer, moved to comfort him, leaving me and Vinny standing in the hallway. I shot a look to my left, seeing another closed and likely locked hatch. The sign above this door declared it the auxiliary machine room. Sighing, I placed my head in my hands. They knew we'd try this. They knew. And they got ahead to cut us off, likely with Will's help. I was just trying to calm myself when the sound, one that was almost so quiet I missed it, reached my ears. Nathan. I froze in place. A massive shiver racing up my spine to the call. It was replaced by a steady stream of chills as my eyes widened behind my fingers. For a moment I waited, barely breathing, as I strained my ears to hear. My heart was doing the macarena inside of my chest. All I could hear it was the soft hissing of the pipes that ran along us and over our heads in the ceiling, along with the soft voices of the men ahead of me. I focused myself to let out a deep breath, trying to relax. You're hearing things, buddy. It's just the pipes, nothing more. They're not down here with you. I was just beginning to believe it, and it came again. And this time, it was unmistakable. Oh, Nathan. It was the man's voice I'd heard on the radio on the second day aboard. The one I'd heard through the radio. The, it, it called out to me in a mocking, sing-songy manner, and without seeing anything, I knew the owner of the voice was smiling, and not a pleasant smile either. I slowly stood up straight, pulling my hands away from my eyes as my breath became ragged and shallow, and then, just when I thought it was impossible to feel any more frightened, the feeling of being watched came again now from directly off to my right. Another chill shot through me as I realized where I was standing. I was standing almost directly in the middle of a T-junction. Oh, shit. Swallowing hard, I... I slowly turned, aiming my flashlight with a shaking hand down the hallway. I almost screamed. The shadowy figures were back. They stood at the end of the hallway underneath a sign labeled Water Softener, an air conditioning plant. I couldn't tell how many there were, but they packed the hall from one side to the other, standing just out of reach of my flashlight's beam. Horror and dread filled every crevice of my body, and I felt myself beginning to shake. I attempted to speak, but my voice seemed to catch in my throat. And then they took a step forward. The horror I felt increased as I saw the overhead lamp wink out, plunging the next section into darkness. I found my voice struggling to pass the single word over my lips. F fuck, fuck. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Vinny turn and look at me. The slight curiosity in his face immediately melted as he caught sight of the expression I wore. Nate, what the hell's wrong? He asked. Faintly, I heard the others stop talking as well as them slowly begin to make their way back to me. I kept trying to force more words out. I have to warn them. My mind screamed at me, but it was as though I'd lost my grasp of the English language. I felt Vinny step next to me and saw his flashlight aim down the corridor, and then I felt him go stiff as a board as he caught sight of what I'd seen. Oh, shit, he breathed, then a little louder. Uh, 
Guys! By now the rest of our group had reached us and everyone collectively aimed their lights down the hall. Thank you for subs. Speak, speak ZY99. I heard Wyatt suddenly begin to hyperventilate as the figures took another step forward. Another overhead light went out. Jesus, the captain whispered. Spencer said nothing, but I knew he had to be scared shitless. Finally, face to face with what he denied about until now. As the third light went out, I finally found my voice again. Gabe? I felt the captain put a hand on my shoulder. What is it, Nate? I swallowed hard, then spoke the words I knew in the marrow of my bones to be true. I, th I think it's time to start running now. The next moment, all of us were turning and sprinting back the way we'd come. Behind us, I felt more than heard our pursuers give chase, and I heard a noise that chilled me to the bone. The sound of the overhead lights just behind us, not just clicking off, but shattering in their housings. The metal halls rang out with our screams and shouts as we urged each other to move faster, reaching the stairs and beginning to climb. Move your asses, everyone! The captain shouted as he dragged Wyatt off the top of the stairs. As we climbed, my eyes flashed to the metal signs indicating what deck we were on. We passed G deck, then F, making our way up. As we reached the top of the landing, I spared a look down. And this time I... I did scream. The figures were swirling up after us. Some didn't even touch the floor, flying through the air in pursuit. I heard the whispers, laughter, and screaming I had heard when I was being cornered by the gym. This time, however, the voices somehow held even more malevolence than they had originally. They're angry. They're, they're downright pissed that we just tried to sabotage the ship. I raced to keep up with the group. We, we just reached E-deck when a loud clanging sound came from above us. I reached the bottom of the next set of stairs when the others had gathered and looked up. I almost screamed again. More shadowy figures were swirling down from above towards us. We were trapped in a pincer movement. There was no way to escape. For a moment, the existential dread I'd felt facing the rogue wave that night came again, and I felt sure this was the end of all of us. Until Spencer let out a cry. Look there! Spinning around, I saw a closed hatch standing a few feet away from us. The sign above it read, Cargo Motor Car Hold. I was the closest to it and leapt for it, my hands locking around the handle and praying that it wouldn't be locked. To my relief, though, the handle spun and the hatch swung open. Come on, I yelled, moving out of the way and letting the others in. As the captain dragged Wyatt through, I slammed the hatch closed as I heard the man's voice ring out again. You're only delaying the inevitable, gentlemen. I felt someone slam into the hatch next to me, turning to see Vinny begin locking the hatch. I, I reached up, I did the same on my side. Not a moment too soon, either. As soon as the last lock had been flipped into place, something slammed into the hatch with the force of a speeding freight train. The two of us leapt back as the banging continued for a few seconds, then abruptly stopped. An eerie, unsettling silence fell over the hold, and after fighting to get my breath back, I turned to look into the room. Crates and other large boxes rose high around us, seeming to go on forever. Directly ahead, my light glinted off something powder blue. I saw it had found what looked like an old mid-fifties Cadillac convertible. The top was down and I saw a matching blue leather interior, accented with white stitching. For a moment, everyone fought to find their breath. Then, the captain spoke. Okay, boys. We need to find a way out of this hold and back up to the upper decks. Try and find another exit. There has to be one. Trying to stay as close to each other as we could, we began to move across the huge hold to find it. I stopped as I reached the Cadillac, reaching out and putting a hand on the quarter panel. The cool metal felt nice against my sweaty hand. I was suddenly overcome with a, a feeling I was about to collapse. My legs felt like jelly under me. I need to sit a minute. Sliding down, I put my back against the car and slid to the floor, putting my head in my hands. I felt myself begin to shake as the image of the figures chasing us replayed in my mind. Get a hold of yourself, Nate. You're okay. You're okay. Keep it together, I whispered. 
Suddenly, a voice came from nearby. Dude, you okay? He was Vinny. Not wanting him to see my fragile mental state, I chose to keep my head in my hands and nodded. Yeah, 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 just, uh, I just need a minute to collect myself after that. I mumbled through my fingers. Vinny replied after a moment. Yeah, I get that, but you shouldn't split up from us. I'm not safe. You know that by now. I sighed. He was right. I know, man. I began before letting out a shaky breath. Just, I, I honestly don't know if we're going to get off this ship alive, and that scares me. Speaking the truth felt like a massive weight had been lifted off of my shoulders. I felt the car rock slightly, indicating he'd leaned against it. He let out a deep breath. Honestly, Nate, I've had the same thought. For a moment, the man's words comforted me, knowing someone else felt the same. Then he continued. But, I mean, maybe it won't be so bad. Confusion washed over me. What? Vinny's voice came again. I mean, come on, eternity on board a classy ocean liner, surrounded by people who just want others to join them? Can't be all that bad, right? Get to party forever, after all. He let out a snort of laughter, but it hadn't sounded like the way I knew Vinny laughed. His laugh was deep, booming. This one had been short and nasally. Another chuckle came, the, the realization suddenly flashing through me as I remembered the radio call yesterday. They can imitate our voices. A fresh dose of fear coursed through my veins as I slowly pulled my hands away from my head, suddenly feeling extremely vulnerable and realizing just how stupid I'd been, but... But there was no one there. I mean, after all, it is inevitable. The voice came from directly over my head. I began to violently shake, beginning to hyperventilate as I heard all pretext of my crewmate's voice melt away. I was, I was terrified to look up, but I, I couldn't help myself. Slowly, and feeling as though I were about to die of a heart attack at any moment, I craned my neck to look above me. A pair of eyes stared down at me, peeking over the side of the Cadillac's hood ones that held both amusement and malevolence in them. The next few moments were nothing but a, a blur to me. The only thing I can remember is hearing my own shrilled screams that and blindly running away as I heard the confused, terrified shouts of the others as they attempted to chase after me. I didn't even become cognizant of anything until I found myself in an unfamiliar foyer. Snapping back to reality, I looked around. I, I could hear the others' voices filtering up from below, calling out my name. What the fuck just happened? Swallowing, I turned and looked over the railing. I could see the flashlights wildly aiming around. I swallowed and yelled, Here! I'm, I'm here! A light flashed up, hitting me in the face and momentarily blinding me. I found him! The captain's voice called. Nathan, stay right where you are. We're coming up! All, all right! I called back down. Then took a step back aiming my light to see where I was. My light flashed off the sign, which declared I'd somehow dashed all the way up to sea deck. Three decks. Then the image of the eye staring down at me swam forward in my mind. I began to shake again, hearing the thing's voice imitating Vinny echo inside my head. Trying to calm myself, I took a few steps into the middle of the foyer, aiming my light around. It reflected off another sign, one that stuck out from the wall. First class swimming pool. Beneath it were a set of double doors which stood open, the light inside spilling out into the landing. I couldn't see much inside, so I took a few more steps until I could see clearly. I blinked a few times. Am I seeing things? I wasn't. The swimming pool was packed. I saw people in old-style bathing suits swimming in the pool. A woman wearing a bathing cap swam by heading left, doing the butterfly stroke. The happy cry of children laughing could be heard, and two suddenly flashed by the doorway as they chased one another. I realized music 
filtered out from the room as well. Old swing music, which was playing from an inner calm inside. None of that caused me to gasp. It was who I saw standing across on the other side of the pool. I struggled to find my voice before calling out, w Will? At my call, he turned to look at me. A huge grin spread across his face, and he raised an arm to wave at me. He looked nothing less than like the happiest man on the planet. And he wasn't alone. A second pair of eyes had turned to regard me at my call. A pair of blue, almost sapphire eyes, ones that for a moment made me feel as though I were falling under some kind of spell. Platinum blonde hair bobbed around the shoulders and voluptuous lips pulled back into a smile. One that held equal amounts of warmth and eeriness to them. She wore a white turtleneck and slacks that accentuated her figure, and a bracelet dangled from one wrist. The lips contorted into a smirk as she snaked an arm around Will's shoulders, and one eye closed in a wink. I'd never seen the woman before, but instantly, I knew who she was. Diana. Then the doors to the pool slammed shut on their own. Will! I screamed, sprinting for the doors as I heard the others reach the landing. I heard them calling out to me, but I was ramming my shoulder into the doors, trying desperately to get them to open. What's happening? I heard the captain cry out. Will! He he's in there! I screamed. Instantly, the others joined me in pushing, and then after a moment, the doors suddenly swung inwards, almost sending us into the pool. I... I froze, feeling a wave of shock flash through me. The pool was empty. What? No. No, he was... He was there! He was there! There were dozens of people in there as well! I began babbling out. There were there were people and there was a woman next to him. I, I swear it, it had to be one it had to be the one he was talking about, Diana, and then the door slammed shut and I trailed off looking at the others. Some held frightened expressions on their faces, but some, like Andrew and Spencer, I saw had confused, disbelieving looks on their faces. I felt a wave of anger flash through me. I'm not crazy! I suddenly began screaming. I'm not fucking crazy! So don't you dare look at me like that! Not after the hell we went through down there! Instantly I saw reality crash into them. Looks of guilt and shame passed over their faces. They knew they are in the wrong here. I saw Spencer begin to open his mouth. But it was cut off as Wyatt began to scream behind him. You know what? Fuck this! The others turned to see him running for another of the red boxes which contained a fire hose and axe. To my shock, he punched straight through the glass with his bare hands, something that should have broken them. But somehow, he yanked an axe from it without a glance at his shredded and bleeding hands. His eyes danced wildly around in his sockets, and I instantly recognized that he'd gone off the deep end. He began to scream again, both at us and around him in general. Fuck this, man! I've had it with these fuckers dicking around with us and trying to drive us insane before they kill us! You fuckers wanna get it on with me? Well, that's fine, cause I'm coming for you! And with that, he turned and bolted up the stairs for the upper decks. Wyatt, wait! The captain yelled. But he was already out of sight. Come out, you 20th century shitheels! I heard him scream. The captain turned to us. Come on, we can't let him get too far away from us! We all began sprinting up the stairs, following the man's voice as he ranted and raved about wiping them all out. He really has gone off the deep end. He's yelling about killing already dead people with an axe. Pursuing Wyatt, we reached the promenade deck and stopped on the landing. Wyatt had stopped screaming. The entire ship had gone dead silent. Not just dead silent, but deadly silence that held the worst connotations to it. Oh. Oh, fuck, no. I thought. I saw the same realization reflected on everyone else's face. I swallowed. Wyatt! I called out. 
my voice muted, bouncing off the carpet and wood paneled walls. There was no answer. Wyatt, buddy! Talk to me! Where you at? Andrew yelled out. Still nothing. And then, slowly, at first, a new sound began reaching us. The sound of sobbing and mumbling. Please. Please, I'm sorry. Please. Not like... Not that. Wyatt. Come on! The captain urged us, leading the way down the hall towards the lounge. The doors still stood open, and I could see the balloons and decorations still on the floor. As we drew closer, my blood turned to ice. As I heard Wyatt begin to scream, half angry, half terrified. No! No, you're, you're not doing that to me! The captain yelled out, Wyatt, we're coming! He was the first to reach the doorway. The axe suddenly swung around from the right side of the doorway, faster than I thought possible. In that horrible split second, my lips began to yell out a warning, but it was too late. The axe buried itself into the captain's stomach, stopping the older man dead in his tracks. I heard him let out a strangled cry, more of a gasp as he doubled over. The axe pulled out of him, blood spilling to the floor from the man's wound. A moment later, Wyatt emerged from around the corner, a wild, insane rage plastered on his face. I got you, you fucking ghost! He screamed in the captain's face. I saw him raise the axe again, this time high over his head as he screamed again. Bleed, you shitter! I saw Vinny and Andrew begin to rush towards him, trying to stop what they saw was coming, but again, I... I saw it too late. I closed my eyes and turned away quickly. I didn't want to see the axe slam into the captain's head. The head of the man who'd taken me under his wing and kept me from going broke. Who helped pay for my aunt's funeral when she passed away. I couldn't... I couldn't bear to... But I heard it. And it's a sound I'll never be able to forget. Horrified silence settled over the room and I turned back, feeling like I was about to vomit as I saw the axe buried into his skull. He lay on his back on the floor, a rapidly spreading pool of blood beginning to surround him, staining the carpet. Wide, horrified eyes stared unblinking up at the ceiling and his mouth was frozen open in shock. The man was very... Very dead. I swung my gaze up. Vinny and Andrea had frozen in place, their arms still stretched out, as if to still try and stop the atrocity that had just occurred. Spencer had clapped his hands over his mouth, his face white as a sheet, as his body shook uncontrollably. My eyes lifted to the blood-spattered face of the captain's murderer. A look of insane rage and bloodlust lingering in... Wyatt's eyes for another moment. And I saw it die away. I saw him snap back to reality. Captain? He asked in a whisper, looking down at the corpse. His breathing quickened, and he lifted his own hands to stare at them, as though he were just beginning to comprehend what he'd done. His eyes lifted to us, and I saw the panic begin to reappear in them. I, I, I didn't know it was him, he began pleading. I ran into the lounge, and I was I was, I was completely surrounded by them. They, they said they were going to kill me, to torture me for eternity for thinking about stealing from the purse's office. They, they called me a coward for crying and then breaking down and daring to attack him. His voice rose to a scream, and then they... They said their leader was coming in, and I, I heard the most horrible voice coming from the hallway. I, I swung for my life, and... He cut off, beginning to shake as violently as Spencer was. He looked directly at me. I'm sorry, he said simply. Then he turned and began sprinting through the lounge, towards the companionway we'd taken to get inside the first night, we remained frozen for a moment, then began to chase after him. Wyatt! Wait! Vinny shouted at him. Wyatt's terrified, hysterical scream flew back at us as he rounded a corner. Fuck you! I'm, I'm not staying on board this ship! I'll, I'll swim home if I have to! 
He slammed into the final corner, and a new, horrific realization hit me. I remembered what I thought about the lifeboats when the Queen Elizabeth had begun moving. He'll be sucked under, and why it don't? I screamed out as we reached the corner. But it was too late. I caught a split-second glimpse of Wyatt flinging himself over the railing. Then he was gone, out of sight. None of us heard a splash. We, we ran to the railing and peered over. For a moment, we saw nothing. Then Wyatt's head broke the water's surface, coughing out water as he began to thrash, attempting to swim away from the ship. And then he was pulled under. Oh, fuck! Spencer yelled. Then began running for the stern of the ship. Vinny and Andrew and I right behind him. Part of me prayed that he would miss the propellers, that he'd be spat out of the back of the ship. Drowning would be a less painful way to die than this. But as we reached the stern railing, I, I felt despair and horror flood into me. Seeing the dark red stain emerge from beneath the ship, spread out with the foam which drifted behind us in the ship's wake. We stood there for a long time, staring out of the water as if doing so would return our lost crewmate. Our lost friend. We could have been there minutes, we could have been there hours. All I know is the next thing I knew, I was looking up to see the sun beginning to set on the horizon. None of us knew what to do. We were numb. Numb and unable to function. So we did the only thing we could do. We went back to our cabin and we, we locked the door. And that's where I am now. There's only five of us left now. The others have... For the life of me, I... I don't know how I managed to fall asleep. I can only guess so much mental and physical energy was sapped from them. To the point they couldn't stay awake. Even if they wanted to. Me? I'm too afraid to sleep. I'm afraid I'll dream of the horrifying things I've seen today. Of the figures, of the voice... The eyes staring hungrily down at me from over the hood of the car in the hold. Wyatt, I did. Driven insane or hallucinating. A false image brought on by those those ghosts plunging the axe into the captain's body and him disappearing into the water. Him being sliced to pieces by the giant propeller plates. The ship is doing everything it can to drive us insane. We have us kill each other, just flat out take us. It's already taken Will. I know he's lost now. There's no way to bring him back. He's one of them. It makes me realize something. I, I said that there's only five of us left, but in reality, there's only four. How much longer, though? I, I don't know. The compass I have in my supply spins around non-stop. I can't even tell which direction we're heading in. I, I don't know how to position our location by the stars. The only person who knew how to do that was the captain. And, he, and he's dead. All I know is this. I'm, I'm not just going to roll over and let the ship take me. I'm going to fight to try and find a way off to help get myself and the others back home or... Or die trying. Will might have wanted to stay in the 1950s forever, but I want to go back to the peace and normality of 2023. Compared to this hell, the relative peace and normality, anyways. I don't know, though. Do any of you guys have any ideas? Any ideas at what to do now? I mean, even if it's the dumbest idea in the world, I'll take it. Anything's better than just letting the hopelessness overwhelm me. Just please give us any direction to take that that might help us get off this damn ship. Please. The music's... The music started again. I hear it filtering through the walls. 
It's a different tune now, but again, I recognize it. Sing, Sing, Sing by Benny Goodman. Not the worst part, though. Someone began softly knocking a few minutes ago in the cabin door and then began calling in, asking us to come and join the party. The voice that asked it was Will's. And then another voice joined him. It was a woman's voice. One that asked the same question with a British accent. And finally, a third voice. One that made me want to break down in tears. The captain's voice. The implications pierced my heart and soul like a dagger. To Will, this ship was... is... heaven. A place where he can eternally spend, frozen in the time period he wanted to go back to. To me... It's hell. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video. I want to give a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. This past year has been rough. I've been gone for quite a while trying to get things um, organized for my own life, and Patreon subscribers, you guys who subscribe everywhere, th this, this has kept me afloat in turbulent waters. So I want to give a very special thank you to Jordan Humble, Diana Kraus, Disciple, Strategy, Wolf, Emoji, Sully Man, Brandon Mendoza, Brimstone, Pandemonium, Kaltuna, William Wellington, Scruffy the Janitor, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Jenna, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Verbal Horror, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Mike, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Gordon Dallas, Estebean, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Dirt Diver 030, Voice of Sand, Psychomel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Croconut 509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. To all you guys and everybody who's included in the description down below, thank you so much for everything that you guys have done for me, and thank you so much for being here when times get difficult. And I can't always be around to make content. I really appreciate your support and I cannot thank you enough. And that goes to everybody who watches these videos. That goes to everybody who's subbed here and anybody who has <laughs> ever liked a creepypasta story ever. I wish you all the best. Sweet dreams.